It was the year 1919, and a young man by the name of Al Capone was making a name for himself in the bustling city of Brooklyn. He worked as a bouncer at a bar run by the notorious mobster Johnny Torrio, and it was here that he first learned the ropes of the criminal underworld. Torrio took the young man under his wing, teaching him everything he knew about the criminal life. Capone quickly rose through the ranks, becoming involved in a number of illegal activities. By the early 1920s, Torrio had relocated to Chicago to take over the city's criminal operations, and he brought Capone with him. The young man quickly became one of Torrio's top lieutenants. Under Torrio's tutelage, Capone learned the ropes of the criminal life, and soon became one of his top earning lieutenants. But fate had other plans for Capone. In 1925, Torrio was nearly assassinated in an attempt on his life, and he stepped down as the leader of the Chicago outfit. And it was then that Capone stepped up, taking over as the head of one of the most powerful criminal organizations in the country. Under Capone's leadership, the outfit expanded its reach, controlling the city's bootlegging, gambling, and prostitution rackets. He was a visionary, a man who understood the importance of having a finger in every pie. And so, he diversified the outfit's operations, ensuring that the organization was never dependent on any single source of income. But Capone was more than just a successful businessman. He was a master of violence and intimidation, using these tools to eliminate any competition and maintain his hold on the criminal underworld. He was a man who was not afraid to use force to get what he wanted, and his reputation as a ruthless killer only added to his already formidable power. Under Capone's leadership, the outfit expanded its reach, controlling the city's bootlegging, gambling, and prostitution rackets. Capone became a wealthy and powerful man, feared by many and loved by few. Al Capone started controlling bootlegging, gambling, and prostitution through a combination of intimidation and bribery. He, and the Chicago outfit used violence and threats to eliminate competition and take over control of these illegal industries. Capone also used his wealth and influence to bribe law enforcement officials, politicians, and others in positions of power to look the other way or assist in his criminal endeavors. Bootlegging, or the illegal production and sale of alcohol, was a particularly lucrative business during the era of Prohibition. Capone and the outfit dominated the production and distribution of illegal alcohol in Chicago and beyond, making a fortune from the high demand for alcohol. Gambling was also a major source of revenue for the outfit, and Capone controlled many of the city's illegal casinos and betting establishments. He also used gambling as a way to launder money from his other illegal activities. Prostitution was another industry that the outfit controlled, with Capone running a number of brothels and operating prostitution rackets throughout the city. By controlling these illegal industries, Capone was able to amass great wealth and power, making him one of the most feared figures in the criminal underworld of the time. By 1929, the city was plagued by the vicious underworld of organized crime, where the likes of Al Capone and George Bugs Moran from the North Side Gang were locked in a battle for dominance and control over the bootlegging trade. Now, these two men had a long and complicated history, with Moran muscling in on Capone's dog track in the suburbs and taking over several of his saloons. And to make matters worse, the North Side Gang, which was aligned with Capone, had already been complicit in the murder of two close associates of Capone. It was on the fateful day of February 14th, that the plan to eliminate George Moran was set in motion. It was 10.30 on the morning of Valentine's Day, February 14, 1929. The sun was shining, but the scene at the garage at 2122 North Clark Street in Lincoln Park was anything but romantic. The North Siders were lured to the SMC Cartage Warehouse under false pretenses with the promise of a shipment of stolen whiskey supplied by Capone's associates in Detroit. The unsuspecting victims, dressed in their finest attire, arrived at the warehouse, only to be met by two fake police officers, 
who were accompanied by two notorious killers armed with Thompson submachine guns. The victims were ordered to line up against the wall and without a moment's hesitation, the killers opened fire, raining a barrage of bullets upon the unsuspecting North Siders. The carnage was immense, with only John May's dog Highball, and Frank Gusenberg surviving, despite being shot multiple times. The two fake police officers then emerged from the warehouse, with their hands up, giving the appearance that everything was under control. However, the reality was far from it, as the warehouse was left with seven bodies, lying lifeless on the floor, their faces almost completely obliterated. Seven men were murdered in a hail of bullets, and the echoes of the shots still hung in the air. The shooters were four men, two dressed as police officers and two in suits, ties, overcoats, and hats. The massacre was widely assumed to be the work of Al Capone, who was at his Florida home at the time. The plan was to lure Moran to the garage and eliminate him, along with two or three of his top lieutenants. But fate intervened, and Moran never made it to the garage. He and his men were approached by a police car, and they immediately turned back, warning others not to proceed. The shooters, mistaking another member of the gang for Moran, carried out their plan anyway. The witnesses saw the men in police uniform leading the other shooters out of the garage, while the victims lay dying on the floor. Frank Gusenberg, one of the victims, survived for a short time but refused to identify his killers when questioned by the police. He died three hours later, his final words, no one shot me. The massacre was a turning point in the history of organized crime in Chicago. It was the final showdown between two of the most notorious gangsters of their time, and it marked the beginning of a new era of violence and intimidation. The echoes of the shots that day still linger, a reminder of the brutal nature of the criminal underworld and the ruthless tactics used by those who sought to control it. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre sent shockwaves through the city, and Capone's reputation as a ruthless and cunning criminal was solidified. It was a turning point in the history of the Chicago outfit, and a reminder of the brutal and violent world of organized crime in America. Thank you for watching Conceptual Learnings The St. Valentine's Day Massacre, The Bloody End of the North Side Gang. Be sure to like and subscribe for more.